Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Nationwide on NTA. My name is Ogoch Puka Ona. The African Union has appealed to the regional leaders of the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, to intensify dialogue with Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. A statement by the President of the African Union Commission, Moussa Faki Mahamat, regretted the announcement of the three countries leaving ECOWAS, calling for concerted efforts towards preserving the irreplaceable unity of ECOWAS and strengthening of African solidarity. He stated that the Commission is available for mediation in resolving the impasse. Similarly, the federal government has expressed concern over pronouncement by the military authority in the Republic of Niger, indicating that the Republic of Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger have withdrawn their membership from the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS. A statement by the spokesperson of Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Francisca Omayuli, says, for half a century, ECOWAS has worked to promote peace and democracy in the region, and Nigeria stands with ECOWAS to emphasize due process and shared commitment to protect and strengthen the rights and welfare of all citizens of member states. The federal government, however, points out that the unelected leaders have denied their people the sovereign right to make fundamental choices over their freedom of movement, trade, and choice of leadership. Nigeria therefore expresses its desire to engage with the three existing countries appealing to the international community to continue to extend its support for ECOWAS and the vision of partnership. And now to the Senate. President of the Senate, Godswill Akbabio, says the 10th Senate will work to transform the lives of citizens and shape the destiny of Nigeria without compromise. At the resumption of plenary after the break, Senator Akbabio urges senators to transcend divides and collaborate with the executive to address the needs of Nigerians. Legislation, he adds, should be tailored to improve the economy, security, health care, and so and ensure social justice. We must be bold in our vision, unwavering in our commitment, and steadfast in our dedication to the principles of democracy and good governance. Five bills passed first reading, including the bills seeking to amend the CBN Act, after which the session continued behind closed doors. And in the meantime, the House of Representatives has resumed plenary for legislative business after its end-of-year vacation. Speaker of the House, Tajuddin Abbas, says security sector reforms, review of the Electoral Act 2022, and constitutional alteration are top priorities for lawmakers as they resume their constitutional duties. National Assembly correspondent Mitai Reikman is standing by to give us some highlights. Over to you, Mitai Ray. The opening address and remarks of Speaker Tajuddin Abbas set the tone for resumption of the plenary of the House of Representatives after the Christmas and New Year holidays. The Speaker was emphatic that while the nation is faced with a lot of challenges across various sectors, the challenge of insecurity is the most important facing the government, which has a duty to ensure the security and welfare of citizens. In these trying times, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has exhibited exemplary leadership and a proactive approach. His recent interventions and directives for more action by security agencies are timely and reflective of his deep-seated resolve to restore peace and order. Indeed, the time has come for the president to demand greater performance and accountability from our service chiefs and all security and enforcement agencies. I implore the president not to shy away from making the tough decisions. If necessary, we must not hesitate to enact changes within our security apparatus for the cause of inaction if inaction is far too great to be at. The speaker went on to announce that the House will convene a national security summit that will chart a way forward for the security sector. He also announced that 
a special technical committee will be set up to review the Electoral Act 2022 and submit proposal on areas that will require amendment of that act. These are some of the highlights of resumption of plenary at the House of Representatives. It's back to you in the studio. Thank you very much, Mitairi. And uh, now the Federal Capital Territory Administration has raised concerns over the re-emergence of Lassa fever, confirming two out of four suspected cases in the FCT. Sandra Akeme brings us details of the re-emergence. Given a national update on Lassa fever, one of the viral hemorrhagic diseases caused by the Lassa virus, Dr. Adedo Lapu Fasawe said Nigeria is fast becoming endemic with hotspot states, including Edo, Ondo, and Delta states, recorded cumulatively 486 suspected cases and confirmed 234 cases with 21 deaths given a case fatality rate of 15.7%. The alert regarding the outbreak of Lassa fever, according to the mandate secretary, was raised by a clinician at Bury General Hospital, where a rapid response team was mobilized to investigate into the cases. Based on a high index of suspicion from the case history and from the fact that their mother had died from a hemorrhagic fever and confirmed with um, confirmed as a Lassa fever case, we immediately swung into action and the public health response commenced. The drugs are not available even in the private sector. It's only available in designated health facilities. She revealed that another positive case the was reported by clinicians at the Abuja University Teaching Hospital, Hospital with the patient currently receiving medical so attention. Cases. Because of our proactiveness, not waiting for it to happen, we are able to nip it in the bud by having only two cases so far, and we have not reported any death in the FCT. The mother secretary appealed to residents to desist from exposing their food to the reach of rats and to also cultivate the habit of reporting strange symptoms to the nearest health centers. In Abuja, Sandra Akeme. NTA News. And still stay with Sandra there. Sandra, if you can hear me, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sandra. Okay, it's uh, Hakima that is there, not Sandra. All right, uh, very good afternoon to you. Let's just go straight to the point now. The Federal Capital Administration and the Nigeria Center for Disease Control have raised concern on the emergence of Lassa fever and the FCT. Can you update us more on the situation at hand? Thank you so much, Ugo. Nice to join you. Basically, since that report, so far they've had like extra cases of this Lassa fever and FCT. We have nine suspected cases as of today because earlier I've interacted with the Lassa fever officer, Dex Management in FCT, and he said so far they have nine cases of Lassa fever suspected in the FCT. So it's been a reoccurring trend and the public health issues. I can remember, trace back in 2023 from the dashboard of NCDC, that's the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, we have 1,170 cases recorded in 2023. That's between January and December 2023. From all the endemic states, we have Edo, we have Ondo, an FCT inclusive. So this year, January, FCT has recorded nine cases. All right, uh, Hakim Suspected Mate. to be Lassa fever and, you know. Go ahead. Okay, so, you know, the authorities, though the numbers are not much, you can't call it an outbreak, but the authorities, like, they've raised concern. They are not leaving anything to chance, so they are on it to nip it at the board. So the, the uh, Federal Ministry of Information is, is already on it. Uh, you can confirm that. 
Yes, the FCT Public Health Emergency Operations Center. Thank you very much. Uh, and we, we do hope uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel so that the country can be safe of uh, infectious diseases. Thank you very much, Hakimat, uh, from the FCT, joining us live. Yes, the WHO. All right, uh, that's all we can take from Hakimat. And now moving on, Vice President Kashim Shatima has inaugurated a recently completed Center of Excellence buildings at Bayero University Kano, constructed by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Mohammed Ibrahim reports that the Center of Excellence is part of the Apex Bank's initiative to help develop tertiary education in Nigeria. The Center of Excellence has two giant edifices situated on the new campus of the university, of which one is designed to accommodate four departments and a dean's office, while the other is an accommodation facility with 190 rooms, state-of-the-art laundry, a kitchen, and a gymnasium. To the glory of Almighty God, Almighty Allah, Amen. The project, inaugurated by the Vice President Kashim Shetima, through the Special Assistant to the President on Economic Affairs, Tokwe Fashua, was flagged off in 2012, completed in 2020, and officially handed to Bayer University in 2023. These centers of excellence are geared towards the field of economics and finance, and that is the lifeblood of any economy, any society. The Vice Chancellor of Bayer University, Kanu Professor Seger Adam Abbas, appreciated the Central Bank of Nigeria for making the university's dream a reality. It's going to boost research, it's going to boost uh, the economy of Nigeria, and uh, we are going to put them to use. Other universities that benefited from the Center for Excellence projects include University of Nigeria, Nsuka, Ahmadu Bello University, Zaria, and the University of Ibadan. In Kanu, Mohammed Ibrahim, NTA And now security matters. The police in Akwa Ibom State is collaborating with sister security agencies to crack down on any person who may attempt to cause a breakdown of law and order during Saturday's supplementary elections. The election is coming up in one federal constituency and one state constituency. Clement Barikwi reports. The February and March 2023 elections could not hold in some polling units in Ikono in the federal constituency and Ibonibom state constituency due to violence that disrupted the process. This time around, security agencies in the state are not taking anything to chance in ensuring the supplementary elections as ordered by the court are hitch free. It's unfortunate that an election can be done three times in a particular place. That tells you that something is fundamentally wrong. And uh, that's what we want to get right now. Already, several meetings with stakeholders are holding, and the police, who is the lead internal security agent, is mobilizing men and resources for the exercise. The command has put up an operation order there's an operation order that will be used. Uh, the men are ready, down ground, they're willing to move any time uh, that we are asked to deploy. We will provide top-notch security. The supplementary elections we hold in three local government areas, 15 registration areas, and 54 polling units in Uyo, Clement Barikui, NTA News. And from Uyo, we go straight to the Center of Excellence, Lagos, where Adeola is standing by for more reports today. Adeola, over to you. Ogochukuka Ona, and welcome to Lagos. with the private sector is key to addressing educational challenges and creating a more enabling environment for teachers and students to acquire quality and qualitative education that will help them live a successful, bright and fulfilling lives. Governor Babajide Sawolu stated this at a stakeholders forum to commemorate this year's International Day of Education. Essie Oamaka reports. 
is no gain saying that education is a human right, a public good, and a public responsibility with the potential of driving economic progress and building a more peaceful and sustainable society. In commemoration of this year's International Day of Education, a stakeholders forum was organized by the Lagos State Government Teaching Commission, TASCOM, with the aim of seeking transformative ways in enhancing the quality of education in Lagos State. Delivering his keynote address, Governor Babajide Songolu called for more collaborative efforts in providing educational opportunities to all children in the state. We want people that will sit and put in place you know, skills and knowledge that we can use to advance you know, the education sector. For us, we said that we need to tackle it in different verticals, provide an enabling environment, create the infrastructure and the process that can make it work, make sure that the pupils are encouraged, they are happy going to school, but more importantly, collaborate with stakeholders, collaborate with international organizations like Teach for Nigeria, and make sure that it's an encompassment is an embodiment of what works and what really, you know, where I need to be happy. Stakeholders at the forum emphasize the role of qualified teachers and well-equipped students in changing the narrative of the Nigerian society. The inequality and inequities that children face in our country today is one that is deeply systemic and complex. And if education is the only hope to lift every human being out of poverty. We are taking this for Nigeria program across Nigeria to all the systems over the next five years. In the mood of the celebration, Governor Babajide Somolu promised a 50,000 naira incentive for each fellow of the Teach for Nigeria Institute for their efforts in enhancing the quality of education in Lagos State. In Lagos, S.A. Owamaka, NT News. Stigmatization of persons with leprosy is as old as the disease, to the extent that the disease and poverty goes hand in hand. Although modern medicine with its multi-drug therapy has been effective in tackling the disease, it is only if it's diagnosed early. In the special report, Larry Belay takes a look at ways of stigmatization of leprosy could be mitigated in the country. With leprosy are stigmatized for life to the extent that the ones cured of the disease preferred to stay in leprosariums or far away from people living in squalor. Medical journals point to the fact that the deformity it left the victims with is often the cause. Another is the perception of people is such that leprosy in its varied forms is infectious and sufferers are worthy of being discriminated against. They are seldom welcomed back into the society, thereby wallowing in poverty, even though it's a treatable disease. Societal stigmatization has made them believe they are unworthy individuals. Advent of multi drug therapy, leprosy treatment has become better. The outlook of leprosy patients has become better as well. These patients are no longer infectious the moment they start the use of their multi drug therapy. And I should let those who associate with them not run away from them. The organism affects the nerves and this can cause the limbs to be cut off and also cause some disfigurement. However, the person who has suffered leprosy does not have to be banished out of the society or stigmatized because of the condition. With the myths surrounding the disease which often fuels stigmatization, knowledge about the disease needs to be stepped up through enlightenment campaigns in communities and religious centers for people to understand that leprosy is another bacteria causing disease and such sufferers should not be stigmatized. In Lagos, Larry Bilayi, NT News. And those are the reports from Lagos. Nationwide will continue in Makodi with Charles after this timeout. Please stay with us at this timeout. The task of building a better nation and making sure we have a Nigerian society that cares for all our citizens is the reason I ran to become your president. It was the core of my renewed hope campaign message. On the basis 
of which you voted me as president. Everything I have done in office, every decision I have taken, and every trip I have undertaken. Thank you for staying and a warm welcome to Makudu. Let's begin with infrastructure where the Federal Roads Maintenance Agency, FEMA, is carrying out rehabilitation work in some sections of the Jalingo Wukari and Bermi border roads. Team leader and executive director administration and human resources of the agency, OK Lumiinka says, road rehabilitation is part of the ongoing Operation Connect Your Destination initiative. Moses Ajawu Ode has details. The Jalingo, Wukari, and Benue border section of the Federal Highway has over the years remained a dead trap to road users because of its dilapidated nature. The collapse of major bus COVID was in the situation. This has brought untold hardship to commuters as business activities and movements were grounded. It is in response to the plight of the people and to ameliorate their suffering that the Federal Road Maintenance Agency through direct labor embarked on the reinstatement of eroded shoulders, embalming washout, and rehabilitation work on the Wukari Jalingo Federal Highway. At kilometer 86 plus 625, you know, there was a washout there, embankment washout that almost cut off the road, and uh, as well as kilometer 86 plus 955, that was a culvert collapse. The culvert collapsed and it was about to cut off the road. While expressing satisfaction with the quality of work done so far on the highway, some road users observed the intervention as apt. We want a government to make a even uh, go slow for us, for here. This port has been a nightmare for motorists, but with the repairs, we can now heave a sigh of relief. The executive director, human resource management of the agency, Oki Olumiinka, accompanied by the Zuna Director, North Central 2, stated their commitment towards road maintenance across the state and the country in general. Funding, ultimately, is one of the challenges we have. But uh, as, as much as we are given to, to work, we show value for money for it. It's an excellent job, and one can say that the staff of Taraba State, the FRME, and the other staff they have done beautifully well. This is a routine exercise being done by the agency to ascertain the quality of work being done and to ensure it complies with engineering standard and specification. From Taraba, I am Moses Ajau Ude, NTN News. Let's now talk health, where Governor Health Saint Alia has pledged to consistently provide access to quality health care services, stating that the health and well-being of the Benue people has always been at the forefront of his administration. This was at the flag off of the human papillomavirus virus HPV vaccine in Makudi. Simbiat Agbaji reports that the governor was represented by the deputy governor, Sam Ode. The human papilloma virus HPV vaccine is a vaccine that protects infections caused by some types of human papilloma virus, which is responsible for cervical cancer and other types of cancers. In September 2023, the vaccine was introduced in two phases with 16 states, including Benue. The flag off in Benue State is the continuation of the phase one HPV vaccine introduction. Beneficiaries of the vaccine say they are excited to be first recipients. I am happy that we are receiving this vaccine. For we have been told that the vaccine is to prevent us from cervical cancer. Now, Prince Pat tells us that we should take the injection because it's very good in girls. The introduction of the HPV vaccine, which is described as safe and free, is not just a significant step but an effective way of reducing the incidence of cervical cancer in the state. The vaccine is safe and free for all. Benue is using 952 teams across 277 wards, comprising of well-trained health workers targeting to, vaccine, to vaccinate 530 young girls aged 9 to 14 years. Some said this vaccination will cause infertility. It has nothing to do with the fertility of a child at all. 
because the cervix will be patterned, the tubes will be patterned, the uterus will be normal. It has nothing to do with the hormones. What is the target of this vaccine is the virus. Deputy Governor Sam Ode says the campaign is not just a medical intervention, but a promise to the young girls and their parents that their lives and future matter. I therefore direct all acting chairmen, and that is the caretaker committee chairman of the respective predatory local government councils, to also flag off in their respective local government areas. We will continue to strengthen our healthcare system and explore innovative ways to improve the well-being of every Benue citizens and non-citizens alike. Various stakeholders at the event urge parents and guardians to support the initiative by ensuring their eligible daughters receive the vaccine. The HPV vaccine campaign will continue to 28 January 2024 and will be available regularly at all primary health care centers. In Makudi, Simbiat Agbaji, NTA News. That report on health runs off our that report on health runs off our contribution from Makudi is back to Ogachukuka in Abuja for the continuation of Nationwide. Thank you, Charles. Welcome back to Abuja. And we are going straight to Ekiti, where the governor, Biodun Oyebanji, has condemned Monday's attack in Oke, a whole area of Ekiti State, which led to two traditional rulers, the Onimijo of Imojo Ekiti, Oba Samuel Olushola, and the election of Eshun Ekiti, Oba David Ogunshola, dead. They were killed in an ambush by armed men while returning from a meeting. The third traditional ruler, the Alara of Araikiti, Oba Adebayo Fatiba, escaped the attack. In a statement, the special advisor to the governor of media, Yinka Uyebodi, says security agents have been deployed to the area to fish out the perpetrators as the governor condos with the people in the affected areas, tasking them to refrain from taking the law into their hands. In the meantime, President Bola Tinubu has also condemned the killing of two traditional rulers in Ekiti State, the Onimojo of Imojo Ekiti, Oba Latunde Samuel Olushola, and the election of Esho Ekiti, Oba David Babatunde Ogunshola, in condoling with families, subjects of the traditional rulers, Governor Biodun Oyebanji, and the people of Ekiti State. President Tinubu pledges that the perpetrators will not escape justice. Meanwhile, the president directs the immediate rescue of pupils and teachers kidnapped around a poro Ekiti area of the state. President Tinubu also assures Nigerians that the nation's security architecture is being robustly fortified for better and expected outcomes. In other news, the soon-to-be-unveiled National Value Charter by National orientation agency aimed at promoting better Nigeria is being advocated to be introduced in schools across the country from primary school level to tertiary institution as a way of inculcating moral values into every Nigerian child. The Director General of NOA, Lanre Isao Nilu, stated this during a, an advocacy tour to Oshun State. Femi Afariogun has details. Since his appointment, the Director General of National Orientation Agency, Larry Isa Onilu, is already working assiduously to achieve the mandate of the agency of consistently raising awareness on positive change of attitude and value reorientation of Nigerians. The advocacy tour train of the DG stopped at Ocean State, where he intimated journalists and staff of the agency that the National Value Charter, a social contract between government and citizens, that will help evolve a united people with common aspirations and a sense of nationalism and pride will soon be unveiled by President Bola Tinubu. And if mathematics and English are compulsory, why is the study of how to be a good Nigerian not compulsory? Make that curriculum compulsory. And again, ensure that we find positive roles for our children in school. And that's why we are starting with 37,000 what we call citizen brigades this year in primary school nationwide. The agency is stepping up its activities on social media and also planning to set up desk offices for various campaigns against criminal activities, lawlessness, abuse, 
and health, among others. The burden will not be on only NOA. Our COMOS, the local government, will now have others who also understand what it is to build peace, what it is to resolve conflict, to work with, and it makes their job a lot easier. Larry Isao Nilu had earlier paid an advocacy visit to the Aragwiji of Aragwiji, Oba Abdul Rashid Olabobi, in Borukwe local government area of the state, where the monarch urged government to make laws to regulate social media, which he said is promoting social vices among youths in Nigeria. Femi Afari Ogun, NTA News. Small and Medium Enterprises Development Agency of Nigeria, Smeden, has rolled out business skills development initiative in 12 states for 715 entrepreneurs, 55 per state. The program is being implemented in Katsina, where participants are impaired, imparted with vocational skills to boost their businesses. Our Haliru reports. In a bid to support medium and small enterprises in a more practical way that the agency developed the National Business Skills Development Initiative. It is a program designed to provide entrepreneurship and vocational skills as well as provision of employment materials for employment generation amongst youth. The 55 beneficiaries were selected from each of the 34 local government areas of Katsina State. Uh, we are running a number of programs in the agency. One of such is the conditional grant scheme the one that is currently on the National Business Case Development Initiative, the one local government, one product, and then a whole number of other pro uh, programs that the agency is running. In entrepreneurial training, we actually explain the essence of bookkeeping to them, the basic business plan. We guide them on how they can go on planning their small businesses. The state government appreciated the agency for its collaboration to enhance vocational skills towards addressing youth unemployment in the state. The beneficiaries are being trained in laundry and tailoring services as well as fashion design and catering to promote youth engagement in productive ventures. It's a great privilege. I'm, I'm calling attention of all the women I use to make sure they utilize what they get trained here very well. At the end of the two-day training program, starter packs will be given to the 55 beneficiaries to boost their businesses. In Katsina, Awal Haleru, NTA News. And from Katsina, we head to Ibadan for the continuation of Nationwide. Thank you, Ogochukuka, and a warm welcome. Rejoin Ibadan in the course of the bulletin. And back here, the demand for equity, transparency, adherence to constitutional provisions, and a fair playground during elections is what members of the National Association of Women Journalists in the FCT are seeking. This has led them on a protest to the National Secretariat of the NUJ in Abuja to express their grievances over perceived irregularities. Monso Demiandati has details. On Saturday 20th, we had a stalemate. The election couldn't hold because the goalpost was being rearranged when the game has already started. Normally, we should vote with Nawaj uh, payment receipts and their uh, office ID. And it was confirmed by the chairperson of the credential committee. But by the time the ele election was about starting, the vice president of Zondi says, Everybody must present uh, NUJ ID card to vote. Many people didn't come out with their NUJ ID card. So. We don't agree. Why, why, we don't agree. We were calling on the VP uh, Zone D to come and address us. For several hours, more than four or five hours, she refused to come out and address us. Then members sat and uh, pass a vote of no confidence on her, motions were moved, and a caretaker committee was nominated. So I and my team are validly uh, recognized by members. 
All attempt to get the national president who was in town in Abuja that same Saturday so that matters can be resolved fail. Now what is an affiliate of NUJ? And as an affiliate, you work with the constitution. It guides the way the union is run and by extension the association. It's professionalism as it is that we have it in our constitution should be entrenched for, for fair play for justice. And if they want peace to reign in FCT in our watch, this should not be jettisoned. The last day of the screening, we were summoned by the VP Zondi, Mrs. Chizova Ogbeche, that the constitution will not be used, that it's left for her to qualify and disqualify whoever she wishes. They are here at the NUJ National Secretariat to seek intervention. Although no official was on ground to attend to them, they believe their message has been passed and they await a positive response. Momso Damien Lati, NG News. Passing a vote of no confidence in a leader is a no-no. I think something should be done urgently. Now, Nigeria has recorded an improved ranking in the corruption perception in this, moving to 145 out of 180 countries presenting 2023 Corruption Perception Index. The Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center indicates that the improvement places the country below the sub-Saharan African average point of 33 points. The index reveals that Nigeria scored 25 out of 100 points in the 2023 CPI compared to the 24 points in 2022. The executive director, Sislak Awa Ibrahim Musa, says the index is impartial and calls for more deliberate effects to improve the records. Effort to show gaps in each country's effort to deal with corruption. A law is only as good as its level of implementation. A law that is not implemented is a dead law. So the call here is for all stakeholders, the CAC and the anti-corruption agencies, to operationalize. And citizenry, too, should continue in their demand for operationalizing this register. The security situation of the country continues to be a challenge, and the corruption in this sector is worrisome. Um, the primary aim of the government is to protect the life um, and property of citizens and the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, when they are analyzing how deep you combat public se sector corruption, they look at the number of high-profile cases you have, not the other low-hanging foods that are very easy to arrest and convict and send to prison. All right, at this point, we join Sokoto for more reports. And welcome to Sokoto. Governor Ahmed Ali of Sokoto State has described his victory at the Supreme Court as a victory for the people of the state. He made the assertion while receiving supporters, well wishers, and party stalwarts who welcomed him at the Sultan Abu Bakr of the Inter International Airport, Sokoto. Nalhatu Abdullahi reports. The overwhelming supporters of the APC came out en masse to welcome Governor Ahmed Aliyu after the Apex Court affirmed his March 18th election victory as the duly elected governor of Sokoto State. He defeated PDP candidate Said Omar, who fought the legal battle at the tribunal appeal under the Supreme Courts, which he all lost. Governor Ahmed Aliyu assures people of the state that the victory is an impetus to him to execute more developmental projects. He called on the opposition to accept the verdict and join his administration to move the state forward. The judgment is a clear testimony of the fact that the national judiciary will remain unbiased as a judgment is put of our own Senator Aliu Magatekadawamako and the state APC chairman Isa Sedek Achida thanked the people of the state for their massive support and urged them to cooperate with the governor. State Deputy Governor Idris Muhammad Gobir, Speaker of the State House of Assembly and other APC stalwarts who were at the airport to receive the governor 
described the unanimous verdicts of the three courts as a clear testimony of Governor Aliyu's good intentions for the people of Sokoto State. In Sokoto, Alhatu Abdullahi, NTA News. The ongoing construction of the basic education units in basic schools in the country is aimed at accommodating out-of-school children. This was stated by the Minister of State Education, Dr. Yusuf Tanko Sununu, while inspecting the projects in Sokoto State. Alhatu Abdullahi again reports. The ongoing basic education units at Government Day Secondary Schools, Wamako, Sifawa, and the Wurno, comprised of principal's office, staff office, classrooms, science laboratories, workshops, and computer science laboratories, among others. 21 similar projects are ongoing in some states of the Federation to fulfill the mission of the President, Bola Ahmed Tinibu, in moving all out-of-school children back to schools. The first phase of the construction of basic education units is part of effort to ensure improvement in infrastructure to provide more classrooms and skills acquisition centers in schools to bridge the gap. In 2024 budget, there is provision of 50 additional basic education units and a second phase of the project through the Secondary School Service Commission intervention. The 21 ongoing basic education units are expected to be completed and furnished in the next six weeks. We are not only stopping on the infrastructure and skill acquisition center. Very soon also we are going to initiate uh, process of recruiting teachers in the country so that at least those schools, uh, the expansion that we have, we have teachers to manage, also the increased enrollment of the out of school children will also have people that will take care of them. The minister also inspected the Federal Science College, Sokoto, which he believes requires urgent intervention considering its obsolete and dilapidated infrastructure. In Sokoto, Dalhatu Abdullahi, NTA News. Well, that's about the size of our package here in Sokoto. Nationwide will continue in Abuja. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. And we go straight. The federal government has inaugurated a 37-member tripartite committee with a mandate to recommend a new national minimum wage for the country. State House correspondent Abdurrahman Jibrila reports. The 37-member committee is expected to engage in open and constructive dialogue to arrive at a fair and sustainable minimum wage. Vice President Kashim Shatima, while inaugurating the committee, charged the members to consider the economic realities at the moment occasioned by the removal of fuel subsidy. I express this viewpoint because the minimum wage represents the least amount of compensation an employee should receive for their labor. And as such, it should be rooted in social justice and equity. I hope that the results of your deliberations will be consensual and acceptable to all parties involved. The government's decision, following the consideration of your final recommendations, will be presented as an executive bill to the National Assembly. With the mandate given by the federal government, the committee is expected to carry the hopes and aspirations of millions of Nigerian workers by shaping the economic landscape of the nation positively. Today, we take another crucial step in fulfilling that promise by embarking on a comprehensive review of the national minimum wage. We shall, by the grace of God, Your Excellency, make some extensive consultations with broad spectrum of stakeholders to, to be able to arrive at a new national minimum wage that is fair, practical, implementable, and sustainable for the good of our people and our country. We don't want to preempt uh, the outcome of this meeting, but uh, you need to understand that the subnationals also have challenges and that uh, the federal government, in its own wisdom, have brought. Uh, the subnationals into perspective, and this discussion will, call, will, will be done together with the subnationals. So I'm not sure we're going to first, uh, foresee any uh, challenge. Okay, Backed with the Minimum Wage Act of 2019, the Tripartite Committee is expected to ensure that all Nigerians 
have the opportunity to earn a living wage that allows them to meet their basic needs and participate meaningfully in the workforce. From the State House, Abraham Jibrila. The announcement of the passing of Chairman DG Team Edward Amana created a vacuum in the NTA family a couple of weeks ago. However, the NTA as an organization, his immediate family, friends and associates have taken solace for the fact that he lived a fulfilled life of hard work and resilience. Omenka Marachuku reports that adjectives were not handy at the night of tributes to eulogize the character and person of former executive director of engineering, NTA, the late Edward Amana, who passed on at the age of 73. You should take solace in the fact that your daddy led a very good life. Your daddy was not just an engineer, was not just a professor, was a patriot. And I know that God in his infinite mercy will grant him eternal rest and will be with all of you. These are kind words to honor a man whom those who cross his path say contributed greatly, not only in the engineering field where he served in various capacities, but in every fit of life, the Director General of the Nigerian Television Authority, Salihu Abduhamid Dembus, also described him as one who has left an indelible mark on the sands of times and urged all and sundry to emulate the good legacies of late engineer Amana. As he related with the various departments, you would be pardoned to think that he belonged to another directorate other than engineering. He was as comfortable in the news directorate as he was in the programs directorate as he provided support to each and every one of these directorates. He gave a very good record of himself in the NBC and made me very proud and made the ministry proud and made the nation proud. Eddie? I praise and thank God for your life. Always with a smile. Someone who has the softest, kindest words for anybody in any situation. Eddie has the greatest heart in this world. Was the chairman, DG Team, who played a leading role in the competitive broadcast industry in Abuja, Umeka, Machuku, and TNU. May his soul rest in peace. And that's Nationwide Today. Many thanks for finding time to join us. Good evening. Thank <laughs> you.